Good afternoon, on behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our thought leader series, The Climate Challenge of Engineered Infrastructure. My name is Megan Purdy and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present. Before we get started today, I would like to acknowledge that today's webinar has been hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, the Department of Transport and Main Roads. TMR is responsible for planning, managing and delivering a single integrated transport network across road, rail, air and sea in Queensland. TMR moves and connects people, places, goods and services safely, efficiently and effectively across the state. The department is committed to ensuring Queensland's transport system contributes to people's quality of life, a vibrant economy and a sustainable environment. It is also committed to improving the lives of Queenslanders by increasing digital inclusion and supporting a thriving digital economy. Now today we'll hear from our three speakers followed by our live audience Q&A and I encourage you all to please send your questions through to our speakers via the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Professor David Hood. David is a civil and environmental engineer with vast experience across major civil and military projects, professional development in emerging economies, senior management in both the public and private sectors and in education. In 2006, David initiated and was founding chairman until 2011 of the Australian Green Infrastructure Council an industry association which developed the world's first full sustainability rating scheme for infrastructure. He led the sustainability program of the CRC for Infrastructure and Engineering Asset Management at, QN at QUT until 2013. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Wood. Well, thanks, Megan, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, but before I get going, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from where we're all calling in today. Sovereignty has never been ceded, and we still have a long way to go to rectify the damage that colonial occupation of what we call Australia has inflicted upon their lands and their culture. I acknowledge that there is much we can learn from First Nations management of country and we engineers have a great role to play in the reconciliation that's, that's needed, very much needed. So a little bit about me. Um, I uh, had the uh, privilege of taking over and commissioning Australia's new parliament house in the mid eighties. Uh, and I couldn't believe just how inefficient that building was. It's got me thinking, why do engineers allow a building to be built like that beautiful building it is, but with such inefficient engineering services? And just as an example, we switched all the pneumatic controllers on the air conditioning over to digital. We changed to a computerized operations and maintenance management system and changed a lot of the lighting and many other little changes. And as we saved in the first full year of operation, 40% of the electricity consumption. And that got me saying to myself, why do engineers allow this to happen? And from that point on, I became embedded in sustainability in the built environment. I had the great privilege of working with Al Gore in uh, 2007 in Melbourne for three days at the Climate Reality Leadership Training and became one of his climate reality leaders. I presented the uh, Climate Reality slideshow to over 35,000 people around the world and in Australia. Uh, and there's Al putting his arm around me and saying, uh, David, do engineers understand the risks of the things that are coming? Uh, but for me, there is something far more important. And uh, here she is, my beautiful uh, little granddaughter. I've got two granddaughters, but this is the first, the second one that was born. And she looked up at me at one week old and she said, Grandpa, is this CO2 thing really serious? Uh, there she is now. She's uh, 15 and she loves the work that I'm doing. She's actually joined me in a few protests for uh, seeking climate action and a better understanding of sustainability. So what we're leaving them in the future worries me. And I believe we are in a global crisis situation. We're in an emergency. The existential consequences of this require an immediate acceptance of the science, which is now clear. The evidence is obvious. And we need an economic transformation that rapidly enables the implementation of solutions. And that's where we engineers come in. I have to say that business as usual, as we understand it today, is not an option. 
our current economic construct is simply not fit for purpose. Um, there are a lot of indicators that we know that we have an emergency right here. It's right now. And I won't read them all, but you can see them there. Go back and have a look at them after the seminar. Uh, some of them are pretty obvious. We are in the sixth greatest extinction the Earth has ever seen. And it's going to, if we're not careful, wipe out all life on Earth. Uh, and the other things there like uh, ocean pollution, the plastics running around in the Great Gaias, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, and uh, air toxification, pollutants and invisible toxins are poisoning our bodies. So we really have to think seriously about how we change all this. The indicators are pretty obvious, and we're going to talk a little bit about tipping points in each of these. And you can see this uh, chart shows on the left-hand side the socioeconomic trends of what humans are doing. And you can see each of those is rising upwards, 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 all upwards. And I won't go through each of them, but they're pretty obvious. And on the right hand side, you can see all of the physical elements changing. And uh, each of those across the top, you can see the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane all rising. The worry that I have with all these, of course, is that they are rising exponentially. And that's where we're heading for what's known as tipping points, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Why can't we simply grow with the current economy? Because there are converging limits that will constrain us. And we'll just have a quick look at some of them. The climate change is pretty obvious. It's coming and it's coming fast. Uh, traditional energy limits, we all know about uh, the energy uh, return from energy invested is, is running to a point where it's now more expensive to get stuff out of the ground and we don't get the return from it. Um, there's things like ecosystem service collapse. We're destroying nature very rapidly. We have species loss, the greatest extinction, as I said before, water and food are all in dire straits. And we've got the traditional financial system collapse. We've seen that uh, starting in 2008 with the great financial uh, collapse and then more things that have been happening since. Uh, and it's all driven by greed and the failure of corporate governance. And of course, we've got dysfunction in society. There's cognitive dissonance. There's so many hoaxes and misinformation flying around that we've got to be very careful about what we see and what we do. Of course, all of these are indicators to me of a very unsustainable system and we've got to fix it. We can't, of course, look at one thing and try and fix it because it will, it will inevitably cause others to go out of balance as well. They are all inextricably linked. So where did this, when did we become aware of this crisis? Who was it that actually brought this to our attention? Well, it was uh, back uh, a century before the last century, 135 years ago, when Savant Arrhenius demonstrated the heat trapping effects of CO2 in the atmosphere. And of course, that's been proven again and again ever since. And then even ExxonMobil scientists back in the 70s were warning the company that their products were causing atmospheric warming. And probably the greatest crime in, in the last century was ExxonMobil's executives then deciding to put out a lot of misinformation about the science and to cast doubt on the science and to cause delay to any action uh, on preventing climate change. Um, a little bit of uh, science, climate radiative forcing is what's mainly causing the warming of the planet. We have uh, light from the sun is coming in in the visible light spectrum, a little bit of infrared and a little bit of ultraviolet comes with it. Most of it is then absorbed by the earth, which then warms because of that light energy going into the oceans and the land. It then radiates one unit out. So we get into a balance and that balance is very important to maintaining uh, a constant 18 degrees Celsius. And for the last 10,000 years of the Holocene, we have been in that very comfortable position where there's enough greenhouse gas in the atmosphere to keep that balance. You get one unit in, you get one unit of out radiation of infrared. What happens, of course, when the infrared strikes a CO2 molecule, the molecule vibrates, which is causing heat, of course, a vibrating molecule is heat. And all of these extra CO2 molecules and other greenhouse gas molecules vibrating is heating the atmosphere. But what happens is those molecules bounce back to their natural state, releasing a pulse of infrared radiation. Half of that radiation goes out to space. The other half, of course, goes back to Earth and warms the Earth. Now, to keep the balance, that would go out. So if we've got a nice balance of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we maintain 18 degrees. But what's happening, of course, is that we're getting more and more greenhouse gases put into the atmosphere. And you've got this cascading effect of more energy being forced back to the earth as infrared radiation and being absorbed. And the earth is warming. 
uh, and we can see by this graph the sort of the spectrum of uh, radiation the ultra the, the visible light rather coming into the earth doesn't interfere with the atmosphere at all there's no absorption there but the infrared radiation coming back from the earth in those three uh, microwave um, spectrums there 2.7 4.3 and 15 microns are absorbed by greenhouse gases they vibrate warming atmosphere and then they re-radiate half out to space and half back to earth and that is causing global warming uh, dr james hansen uh, uh, probably the most famous of our climate scientists he first drew attention to the problem in 1988 before the uh, u.s senate uh, and he's recently warned last year with two other major scientists in a, in a paper that he published that the earth was moving toward a new climate frontier with temperatures that are going to be higher than at any point over the past million years, bringing impacts such as stronger storms, heat waves and droughts, impacts for engineers that we must take note of. And you'll all know of my, Dr. Michael Mann, who brought out the famous hockey stick a few years back. And in his new book, The Climate War, he shows how fossil fuel companies have waged a 30 year campaign to deflect blame and responsibility and to delay action on climate change. And he offers a plan in his book to, to how we can solve it. So the energy that's coming into the earth from these, uh, from both the uh, absorption of infrared in the molecules vibrating and the force back to earth of infrared through radiative forcing is equivalent to some 800,000 Hiroshima style atomic bombs going off every day. That's the energy being absorbed by the Earth's systems. And of course, that is causing incredible disruption to our climate, massive changes to the climate. But my worry is that these things are shifting into what's known as tipping points. And I'm going to talk about how these tipping points are going to occur and what they will mean for engineering and the, and the worries we should have. And the best way of looking at that is to look at the planetary boundaries, which is work of the Stockholm Resilience Institute a few years back, where um, Professor Will Steffen of the ANU uh, sadly passed away last year. But Will was one of the uh, leading scientists in putting together the planetary boundary uh, system. And you can see nine sectors of the Earth's systems that they uh, put together. They then researched through hundreds of, of scientists and described the data that needed to find various zones on it and of course you have in the blue circle there the data if you keep the data and and the things between that uh, red that blue circle rather you're in the safe zone and you can see that we're exceeding the safe zone in pretty much all of the areas of the earth systems uh, the red circle shows the danger zone moving out beyond that is into what we call the collapse areas and as you can see there there are two areas of the nine sectors where we have exceeded the safe zone and we are heading for collapse that's in the biochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen and of course the bio biosphere integrity and that's mostly related to species integrity and the genetic diversity and so on so these things uh, worry me uh, about the physical attributes and we're heading for the tipping points in those physical attributes kate rawworth did some great work in, in looking at the not just the physical attributes of the systems of earth but also some of the social things and she developed what's known as the donut ec ec economy, where we've got to look at the social things and the things that are affecting humans. And you'll see in the green circle around there, uh, the social aspects that she developed figures for, and the red uh, heading into the center are the percentages of where we're shortfall in social impacts. Uh, just as an example on two of them there, um, in terms of, uh, connectivity and safe feeling and so on. We have a large percentage of people that have got no internet. We have a lot of people in spaces around the world where they don't have the support that they need and they don't have connectivity. Uh, on energy, for instance, we still have a lot of people who don't have cooking, proper cooking facilities, and there's a high percentage of people without electricity. So those social things need to be pulled back into the green donut safe zone and the physical ones need to be pulled back down into the safe zone. These are leading to tipping points, and I'm going to talk a little bit about tipping points. A tipping point is a critical threshold that, when crossed, leads to large, accelerating, and often irreversible changes to the Earth's system. And some of them uh, are obvious to us now. Uh, the coral reefs, we've seen recently the Southern Great Barrier Reef has had the first serious bleaching ever, just recently, last year. And all over the world, we're seeing 
bleaching of coral reefs because of the warming ocean. 95% uh, of the earth, uh, the heat coming into the earth from radiative forcing is absorbed by the ocean, and that's causing the acidification of the ocean and also the uh, bleaching of coral. Greenland ice sheet is, is, a, is a big worry. Um, it is melting faster than ever. In fact, if we just go to the next slide, we can look at some of these in terms of the map of the earth, and you can see uh, um, there the uh, Greenland ice sheet, the gray blob at the top. The ice there, if it all melts into the ocean and it is melting fast, the earthquakes on the ice have increased by 500% in the last 10 years. If it all melts into the oceans, we'll get a seven metre sea level rise globally. That's pretty horrendous. And the West Antarctica ice shelf, that's the one down in the blue at the bottom of that map, it is melting rapidly. The sea ice is melting because the circulation of ocean currents around Antarctica are wobbling and letting hot ocean currents flow in under the ice, melting that ice. So the floating ice is breaking away, melting, and what that's doing is releasing the buffer, which is holding the glaciers on Antarctica, back on the land, and they are sliding into the ocean much faster. And if the West Antarctica ice glaciers uh, collapse into the ocean, we'll have a seven to 10 metre sea level rise. So you can see that pretty serious tipping points. The other tipping point that we probably hear about a lot is the Gulf Stream. That's the purple wiggle up the middle of the Atlantic Ocean there. It warms Europe from uh, the warm area of the Gulf. And if that shuts down, and it will shut down because of the ice melting off Greenland, causing density changes to the upper Atlantic Ocean, it will stop and the warming effect will go and you'll find that England and Europe will start to freeze over. And then people say, oh, that's not global warming, it's freezing. Well, actually it's caused by global warming. Uh, and there are other things there that are happening, of course. So the science, we, look, where does the science come from and what are we, where do we go to get science? Unfortunately, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has been the main sort of area where we get the results of climate science and the evidence from, it was created in 1988 from the WMO and the United Nations Environment Program. There are 195 members of it. They go through an incredible process of peer reviewed scientific papers. They review them all. They write up reports. The reports are then put together in a summary for policymakers, which is then submitted, interestingly, to the government members of the IPCC. And they then review that SPM, the uh, policymakers submission summary. And what happens is it's watered down. By the time the public the reports become public, they are out of date. And when published, of course, they've been watered down by the review process. And we have the COPs every year. The COP28 last year was held in uh, the Emirates. Unfortunately, they have become a talk fest, largely run by the industry that we need to shut down, the fossil fuel industry. And as an example, the president of COP28 was the chair of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, Sultan Al Jabbar. And his company, for instance, put 2.7 million barrels of oil into the system in 21, and he plans to double the output of oil by 2027. So these are the sort of things that we're really worried about. But we should be going to real science. And the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact has done some wonderful work in actually getting the real science out. It's made the statement last year that climate change assessment process from IPCC mainly has tended to focus on the most likely outcomes rather than the high risk outcomes. This is poor risk assessment and it's leaving society ill-equipped for the tipping points that lie ahead. The intensity and frequency of extreme rainfall will increase exponentially with global warming. Um, so engineers have got to think about this. Global warming will intensify heavy rain. A warm atmosphere can hold a lot more moisture and therefore you're going to get a lot more rain bombs as Al Gore likes to call them and future floods, as we've already seen, will become far worse. The Lismore flood last year and others have been an example. I maintain hope though, because there are some tipping points coming that will lead to disproportionately large and rapid beneficial results, mitigating climate risk and helping humanity on a more sustainable pathway. And some of these are just, I've listed there. The, the cost parity for renewable power generation, it is now cheaper to put electricity in from wind, solar with battery storage than it is to generate it from fossil fuels. And technologies such as electric vehicles and heat pumps are starting to explode. Uh, Tesla's uh, sold far more than any other electric vehicle in Australia last year. 
I think we're going to see a shift to less intensive uh, energy activities. Uh, Saul Griffith and his Electrify Everything, there are now many suburbs around Australia that are going to zero emissions through their collective activity in the suburb. I think you're going to find divestment away from fossil fuels will suddenly tip and there'll be companies, the oil companies and the coal companies won't be able to find the money to do their mining and their exploration. I think that the academic research will show us a lot of tipping points as well, where suddenly we'll find things like batteries will explode with new technology. The other thing that I think will happen is we'll start to wake up to ourselves about the misinformation out in the internet, and there will be a tipping point there. Uh, all of these, of course, the positive uh, tipping points will require human intervention, just as all the negative tipping points are a result of human intervention. So what can we all do as engineers? Well, first, we must read and adhere to the Code of Ethics. I would ask each of you, when did you last read Engineers Australia's Code of Ethics? We must seek out the truth, accept the science, fact check everything, practice within your competency limits, and don't be afraid to criticise. Resign if you happen. If your boss asks you to do something that's unethical, then resign if you don't. Don't do it or you become unethical. Analyse your project for impacts across the nine planetary boundaries. Design to regenerate the ecosystem services that might be lost because of your project and use the sustainability tools. Every tool you can find, use it. Clearly define the sustainability outcomes from your project. Look, there are plenty of tools around. Here's just some of them that you can actually go to uh, and you can use. But the one I want to focus on is this fellow here. The um, Infrastructure Sustainability Council has developed the IS rating tool and it is a purpose a member-based purpose-led organisation in Australia and New Zealand, which will enable you to plan and to measure sustainability outcomes in your infrastructure. This is a diagram that I, it's a bit complex and I'll let you look at it later when you're outside the, web, the webinar, but it shows on the horizontal axis the inter integration of human consciousness with various projects and what we do, starting from sort of uh, destruction of the nature just to build things through to minimising damage and conserving right through to becoming part of nature, right up to being within nature. And all our projects should be designed to be part of nature and not to destroy nature. Um, and up the top, you see it starting off at the sort of biophilic level, the, the, the microorganism level, lifting right up to the total earth level through the various community uh, relating. So it's moving from degenerative to regenerative uh, systems. It's a good diagram. Engineers need to understand a bit more about biomimicry. And we've seen things like the, um, the, the Shinkansen in, in Japan, that's its uh, front end there, the Kingfisher. The gecko's footprint, Van der Waals force on those little webs hold it from falling off the ceiling. The spider web is stronger than steel and shell structures are an amazing thing, how they can, nature constructs them to be strong. And Arab have developed this uh, fantastic printed bridge, which um, is, is a model here at the moment, but this is the way they put it together putting the metal where the strength is needed, not where it's not needed. So you don't print the metal in areas where there's no strength needed. These are the sorts of things we engineers have got to do. Um, and that's about it for me. What I'm saying is that you've got to really focus on how you're going to deliver sustainability, understand the climate science and implement measures that will mitigate greenhouse gases, mitigate the damage to nature, and rebuild nature and regenerate nature. And thank you very much. If you want to go further, you can send me an email and um, I'll be happy to respond to any of these. So thank you again, as my grandson saying, thank you, Papa, it's worse than I thought. Thank you, David, for your presentation and insights. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker for today, Narelle Dobson. Norelle is a civil engineer with more than 25 years experience working in various road and rail infrastructure, design, construction, technical government, governance, I should say, and asset management roles. For the past two years as the agreement manager managing the National Asset Centre of Excellence Research Program, Norelle has championed emerging technologies and innovations to promote performance, sustainability and savings benefits for the Department of Transport and Main Roads. Currently, Norelle is also supporting TMR Sustainability and other engineering teams to, prior to prioritise TMR's response to the Queensland Government Climate Action Plan. Please welcome Norelle Dobson. Thanks, Megan. 
and hi everyone out there online. First of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where we are meeting or where we are located today. I would like to pay my respects to the elders both past and present and respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people online with us today. Queensland, home to more than 5 million of you, connecting you from A to B by more than 33,000 kilometres of state-controlled road, 6,600 kilometres of rail track and 124 million public transport trips each year. Our job, no, our passion is to deliver a network that is accessible to everyone at every age or stage. We're investing more than $6 billion to improve our transport infrastructure, making your roads more flood resilient and bringing new ways to pay so you can use our network your way. We're making your health and safety our top priority. We're always listening to you, creating more online services than ever, serving customers online over 12 million times each year. We've kept the state moving, transporting more than 1 billion tonnes of freight, adding more than 23 kilometres of new cycling infrastructure and building and upgrading new boating infrastructure too. We're investing more than 1 billion to maintain and improve our network operations. We're recycling 1.5 million tyres and using them to build our roads. We're switching more than 35,000 streetlights to smart LED technology. We're creating a transport system that's environmentally friendly and socially sustainable, investing in skills, creating jobs and embracing new technology. Queensland, we're here for you to connect you to family and friends, work, schools and hospitals, to create a single transport network accessible to everyone. So we've just heard David Hood's insights into the changing climate and its impacts on people and the environment. These impacts are being experienced in Australia and around the world as they increase in frequency and intensity. For example, in Queensland in the last 10 years, we've had 98 declared disaster events and over 2018 and 19 summer alone, we experienced 12 disaster events, more than we've ever had before. In the last 10 years alone, the Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads has spent $6 billion in disaster recovery funding. And you can see some of the projects there in the slides. Um, you know, it's quite graphic, it's quite devastating, and um, there's a lot of work to do to repair it. The Queensland Government's Climate Action Plan uh, website provides details of the weather science that we can expect to see as the climate is changing. And what I'm noticing is what previously was described as unprecedented, I'm sure you've heard those terms, or an anomaly, is now being spoken about as trends or even normal. Our Queensland Climate Action Plan has two main strategic actions relating to greenhouse gas emissions reduction and guidance towards climate ad adaptation and resilience. And the rest of my presentation is to talk about these two strategies. But I'd firstly like to identify that while a lot is being said about the need to improve climate resilience and reduce emissions, many of the solutions for addressing this are technical. They are real world problems that require real world solutions and engineers and other technical teams are absolutely critical to making that happen. You can see on the slide that there's a number of Queensland government targets there for emissions reduction. And to further the, inform these targets, um, we're currently developing roadmaps for transport net zero and reduced emissions for government infrastructure. So watch this space on that. In addressing the climate risk aspects, the approach of our Engineering Policy 170, which you can find online, is to identify the key climate variables, including the variability that differentiates regional climate zones, develop scenarios based on latest climate science, identify the risks that may impact these projects based on that information, complete a climate change risk assessment using 
traditional Australian standards 5334 risk management framework. And as part of that, identify mitigation measures that are commensurate with the risk targets, risk ratings, and assess the residual, residual risk, considering adaptation measures to treat all high and very high risks. Moving back now to the emissions aspect, which is um, mostly what I'll be talking about um, in this presentation. While the engineering approaches I'll be mentioning to reduce emissions are specific to transport infrastructure, these principles are broadly applicable to all infrastructure. So infrastructure emissions are embodied, which means they are in the materials through both their inherent chemical properties and the processes that are required to manufacture and construct them, along, of course, with the ongoing maintenance that they require to remain in use. Because of this, the quantities and types of materials that are used will have the greatest impact on embodied emissions. So in design and build, we need to think about how we can make best use of what's already in place in harmony with the best use of new construction and operations to optimise the whole of the emissions. Some of those strategies are in the slide. The slide bullets point speak to that. We know that many high carbon intensity infrastructure materials require high energy in manufacture and placement. How can we improve the emissions reductions for that energy? So, the slide is really talking to knowing what's there in the asset and taking every opportunity to reduce the need for additional assets, perhaps even refuse to change that asset, to reuse what's there, to recycle what's there. And we're hearing from industry that modularity is really important both to productivity but also to establishing the processes that assure the consistency that can reduce emissions. Of course, using lower emissions plant is quite an obvious one as, as that speaks to often the fuels that are used. And this is a critical one in transport infrastructure, design and build it right the first time. If we can get that right, we can re reduce rework and maintenance. Our climate-friendly engineering approach also relies on materials. It's more carbon-friendly often to use recycled materials. As part of the build-to-last approach, we need to make sure that our materials will perform for the design life without premature failures or unplanned high emissions repairs. For example, our Queensland roads are typically designed to last 20 to 40 years and our structures such as bridges to last 50 to 100 years. Because of this, the development of lower emissions material often requires extensive research to understand how they will perform in the longer term and not just their emission profiles in the shorter term or as we call it, upfront carbon. This will often involve laboratory testing, field trials, evidence-based review of uses in other places testing in the context of specific climate profile and the warranty and asset management context of its use. Where they can deliver the required performance, another great material is locally occurring materials. They are often very good low emission options as they have high place value input products that derive a lot of value from their smaller transport distances. Some of the approaches that TMR uses to optimise our local resources are that we administer a quarry registration system of some 350 quarries throughout Queensland. This supports the preparedness of industry to deliver usable, low emissions materials to projects. We also employ engineers and crews in local offices who can retain the learnings from their experiences working in local conditions with local materials. Some of this experience is captured into our Western Queensland Best Practice Guide, which is available online. 
Through our waste to resource strategy, TMR encourages and prefers the use of recycled materials over conventional ones, where they are permitted by the specification and, of course, cost competitive and available. It's important that recycled materials provide performance that is just as good, that doesn't harm the environment or people, and that also we are able to recycle it at the end of its life. This table summarises the permitted use of recycled materials in TMR specifications. And at this point, to prevent perverse or unintended outcomes, such as through uncertainty in supply chains, we currently do not mandate the use. But you can see there that there's a lot of options, as of right options for recycled materials in the specification suite. In-time asset management of transport infrastructure is absolutely critical for emissions reduction. For example, timely resealing of bituminous sealed surfacings, which is the majority of the state network, prevents surface cracking, water entry, and ultimately potholing, and reduces risk of increased roughness and even pavement failure. And Smooth pavements generate far less emissions, which for the current fleet of combustion vehicles is typically 75 to 99% of emissions for transport infrastructure. Our understanding at this point is that the most cost-effective asset management strategy for a road correlates very well to the lowest carbon solution. For TMR, the sustainability road ahead has two main lanes. That's program-wide improvements to guides and standards. This enables consistency and stability in the supply chain and in use in contracts. And we're hearing a lot about that from our partners in industry. There's also the option of project-specific innovation that can provide an opportunity for new ideas, though more thought needs to be applied to this in contracts, risk sharing and performance. Research is critical for both. Governments, academia and industry are all vital to achieving improvements for addressing these challenges. And TMR is working very closely with its peak body industry partners supported by member companies through their contributions of materials, participation in trials and collaboration toward developing specification improvements. And I'll be talking a bit more about that. One of TMR's main research programs is through NACO. And we partner with ARB, the Australian Road Research Board, which is currently under NITRO to do this. There are a range of current and historic projects where results have been published on the NACO website, and uh, they're also incorporated into specifications. Key areas for this research are pavements, sustainability, asset management, structures, road safety, and network operations. NACO has an annual research program. The 66 projects in this year have been selected consistent with the themes that you can see on the slide. Um, sustainability improvements, productivity improvements, uh, improved maintenance and operations, and improved safety. Just like to mention for you now some of the examples of this work that's been undertaken. NACO projects are scoped to increase the range, quantities and permissible use of recycled materials. All of these projects rely heavily on cooperation with industry peak bodies and companies to supply the materials for laboratory testing and production and the construction trials as we work together to increasing use of these products. Some of the advantages of this is that up to 8,000 tonnes of construction and demolition waste can be diverted from landfill per kilometre of road. And the coal combustion products, up to there's, there's up to 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the use of fly ash and up to 40% reclaimed asphalt pavement can be used in new asphalt. So there's a lot of that possible applications there. We did a trial with recycling glass into asphalt 
on the Malanda Road and approximately 850 tonnes of glass are consumed annually in Australia. The Malanda Road contribution was significant for that with 200 tonnes, 1 million bottles. It was only achieved through collaboration with the Australian Flexible Pavement Association and its members, and it's been influential in allowing these treatments into our specifications. So for generating low carbon emission solutions, NACO research has been directed at reusing or improving virgin and in situ materials, such as through adding small amounts of bituminous or cementitious binders. This can add significant climate resilience as well. As each material is unique though, research has been directed at understanding optimal and customised mixed design requirements production requirements and conformance testing. Along with numerous Queensland universities, several industry peak bodies have assisted with this research. Cement Concrete and Aggregates Australia, Ostab Pavement Recycling and Stabilisation Association and the Ash Development Association of Australia have been particularly important in working with NACO to progress these projects. The use of foam bitumen stabilisation has been one of NACA's premier projects and it's proven to be an integral part of Queensland's resilience to numerous weather events. So you can see there some of the projects that have had foam bitumen stabilised pavements that after the flood event have performed really well. So NACO has informed the development of these standard specifications and there are ongoing projects to improve mixed design methodologies towards increasing the flexibility and improved fatigue life of these materials. The introduction of the French EME2 asphalt into Australia is truly a story of collaboration. This asphalt was first observed by Australians during one of the Australian Flexible Pavement Association International Study Tours, which was attended by industry and government. After its potential was realised, it was flagged up to Austroads, Australia's transport's jurisdiction's peak body, who organised a program of testing to translate the French requirements for Australian use. Through the support of AFPA, our local asphalt companies and bitumen binder suppliers provided in-kind support, sending materials to France and for our local testing. Brisbane City Council, undertook Australia's first field trial. NACO led a multi-year project to monitor the field trials and develop a methodology for including the materials into pavement designs. TMR used these Austroads and NACO research findings to develop Australia's first EME2 specification for designing the mixes and using them in construction. The technology has since been adopted more widely throughout Australia, including that AFPA have developed a model specification for this wider use. Now, this example is a terrific example of collaboration and teams working seamlessly together. The investment has been high. It's our second biggest spend in NACO over our 10 year program, second only to our in situ stabilisation work. But as you can see, the dividends pay off. You can see EME2 allows thinner pavements to be constructed using less material and less emissions. The material is very climate resilient as well. My, Dave, my colleague David Smale from the Australian Flexible Pavement Association will be speaking to you next about some other very exciting work that our TMR AFPA Strategic Alliance, which has been in place for over 20 years now, is about to be launching. So Engineers Australia tells us that sustainability thinking is a mindset that all engineers should be aligned to. We have responsibilities to maintain up-to-date knowledge and understanding. This also means that we are being considerate and thoughtful about the impacts of our actions and our influence on the world. And that's for all sectors and all engineers and technical people. The Climate Action website identifies strategies for everyone. So this is a challenge for us all. We have learned a lot of, about engineering in our uni and on the job. 
but the world needs us technical people like never before to work together and apply our best and creative technical skills to these really important critical questions facing our world. So it's not just the purpose, performance, risk and cost lens that we look for. Engineers increasingly and critically need to be considering resilience and kilotons of carbon dioxide. Thank you and stay connected. Thank you, Narelle, for your presentation. I'd now like to welcome our final speaker for today, David Smale. David has served the construction and asphalt industries for over 50 years, starting his career as an engineering surveyor and has served as regional managing director for Aztec Australia since 2008. Throughout his working life, David has always been involved with Australia Flexible Pavement Association. He is currently the vice chair and secretary of the association's Queensland branch, the chair of the TMR and Association Sustainability Pillar Committee, and a board member of the Queensland Transport and Main Roads and Associations Alliance. Please join me in welcoming David Smale. Right, thanks, Megan. And thanks too to Norelle and, and David for providing such great context. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to make this presentation to you today. Uh, I've tagged my presentation, History in the Making, because in my mind, this is History in the Making. By way of introduction and background, first of all, uh, my viewpoint is that of a pragmatist. Uh, think of me as a practitioner with 50 years of experience who believes greatly in teamwork, that results come from good collaboration, solid alignment, great planning, and, and great execution. My presentation today is a short 10 minute, what you would call maybe a case study on the positive outcomes of the collaboration model adopted by Queensland TMR and AFPAS Alliance and the immediate impact their alignment is having on results towards reducing our carbon footprint. First though, let me take you back a little, a little in time. In late 2021, the TMR AFPA Alliance board met to discuss how they could be more effective. The, the Alliance decided to change the way we work together from being strongly consultative with a technical bias to being strongly collaborative and aligned on strategic direction and implementation. After all, the Olymp Olympics were only a decade away and we knew that delivering the infrastructure for the Olympics was critical. By 2022, our Alliance was collaborating to implement a new strategic plan with a commitment on decarbonisation. The industry had realised that achieving 2030 and 2050 goals would rely on a whole of industry approach where strategic and incremental improvement, improvements in operations would collectively contribute to our green, greenhouse gas reductions. So TMR was committed, AFPA was committed, so being committed and aligned was achieved in a heartbeat. The Alliance socialised their good progress on what they were doing. They had shared, shared imperatives and five strategic pillars. Those pillars were people and inclusion, safety and wellness, future technology, delivery and sustainability. Our sustainability mission is collaborating to deliver safe, sustainable and innovative new road pavements for Queensland. A detailed roadmap was created for all five pillars. This roadmap was reviewed, agreed and formalised. Pillar committees were established jointly from TMR and APA with the express purpose of enabling change and empowering decision making. Metrics were established for all pillars. Our sustainability metrics are to increase use of recycled materials, are to increase the durability of our pavements and to decrease our whole of life CO2 emissions from road infrastructure. 
First, I think we should we really need to understand the carbon footprint of an asphalt plant. So the pie chart on the left shows that an asphalt plant makes up 43% of the carbon footprint, so just less than half of the carbon foot footprint from rock to road. That is from quarrying the materials out of the ground to producing hot mix and dispatching it in a truck to go to site. The pie chart on the right shows that 90% of that asphalt, being the asphalt plant footprint, comes from the burner at the asphalt plant, which is used to dry aggregates to remove moisture and to heat the product to temperature. So what is the source of these emissions from the asphalt plant? AFPA has scoped or categorised, if you like, these greenhouse gas emissions as being direct or indirect. Scope one is direct emissions from the burning of fuels. Scope two is indirect emissions from purchased electricity. And scope three is indirect emissions from raw materials, supply and transportation. Today, we will focus on just one and three only. So scope one, reducing our direct emissions by burning less fuel. Reduce temperature and energy by the use of warm mix. So warm mix for lower mix production temperatures. Scope three, reduce indirect emissions by using less raw materials. That is by using wrap or recycled asphalt pavement materials. So materials that we mill off our road uh, when we're doing maintenance works or resurfacing works. Under scope three, recycled asphalt pavement, commonly known as wrap, replaces virgin aggregate and virgin binder. The energy consumption by the plant can remain nearly unchanged, with no upstream carbon footprint apart from the transportation itself. These days, plant designs enable high amounts of wrap to be heated and blended consistently. And there are multiple plant designs. These pictures are just an example of a few. We look at the scope one bucket, which is deploying now, asphalt production is inherently a thermal process. Lowering the production temperature of hot mix will reduce the energy required to heat and so reduce fuel consum consumption required and the emissions, and as a bonus, will reduce binder oxidization. The impact of wrap on our carbon footprint is tremendous. Recycled asphalt, has enormous benefits. Processed wrap has only 40% of the carbon footprint of a similar quantity of aggregate. Why? Because we don't need to mine it out of the ground. In fact, our roads are now, now our mine sites too. Further, for every percent of binder replaced, the mix will have an estimated carbon footprint reduction of six and a half kilograms of CO2e per tonne. Compared to a virgin mix, a mix that uses 20% wrap has a 20% decrease in carbon footprint. If we look at the delivery impact of warm mix on our carbon footprint, the impact of warm mix is immediate too, knowing that less energy is required to produce mix at lower temperatures, and by doing so, we will reduce our carbon footprint by two kilograms per tonne for every 20 degrees C. So what if we do both? What if we do both wrap and warm mix? What impact will that have? So looking at the combined impact of wrap at just 15% and warm mix at just 20 degrees only, we know that we can achieve an 8.2 kilogram of reduction in CO2e per tonne. You're probably asking, can we do more? Well, yes, we can. And there is so much opportunity to move the needle very quickly on this. In fact, if we remember that 155 degrees C is at the very top end of the temperature range for warm mix, then obviously there's, there's more room to make a difference. 
I've also been told that some local governments still don't allow a wrap in the use of their pavements. So some still consider wrap to be a waste product, so even more opportunity. My view, my view is very strongly that we can double the impact. Industry has already proven more mixed capability, and this was what enabled TMR and AFPA to reduce the maximum temperature specified, or about to reduce the maximum temperature specified, for some of our mixes by 20 degrees. TMR spec revisions have been circulated, reviewed, and accepted by industry already, with new specs for MRTS 30 and MRTS 32 launching this month, March 2024. Over the next 18 months, industry will monitor our impact and trial even lower mixed temperatures. I'm confident by the end of this year, sorry, the end of next year, the sustainability pillar will be sitting down to implement the next step in reducing the energy further to make asphalt. Look, I know this is a busy slide too, but let me break it down a little bit for you. And before I close, also leave you, our engineers of Australia, with this challenge. Today, we have identified just two scope one and three options that can reduce our asphalt carbon footprint by 9%. We are delivering on these two options, wrap and warm mix, now. How are we doing it? We are doing it through a whole of industry approach where strategic and incremental improvements in operations will co collectively contribute to our greenhouse gas reductions. Yes, we have the smarts and the pathway. Look at this waterfall chart on the right, showing that 30% reduction is very achievable and that we are already achieving 9% of that 30%. My challenge is, let's go and get the other 21%. In summing up, our TMR AFPA collaboration model is working. It is enabling a whole of industry approach. It is empowering decision making. It is delivering solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in my mind, it is making history. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Well, now I'll invite all our speakers um, to the floor and I'll invite you, our audience, to send through your questions. So um, what we might do, and a big thank you to everyone who submitted their questions while registering for today. What I thought we might do is kick off um, our Q&A with some of those questions. So um, my first question will be to, David Wood. And David, this question is from Helen Fairweather, who I'm sure you know well. Um, and Helen's question is, how do you move the development of transport infrastructure from the induced demand model? Thanks, Megan. And thank you, Helen, for the question. Um, this is, it, it amazes me that um, when people uh, complain to their politicians, it seems that congestion is what they want to reduce politicians, their answer is simply widen the roads, build more roads, do uh, intersection changes and so on. It's well known that what happens then is that everybody says, hey, they've just done this new road widening. Let's go. To, let's get the car and go into work. And your you, you use of, of cars increases. How do you change that? Well, I believe that we've got to, we've got to spend more emphasis on active transport, footpaths, cycleways, and introduce free and more frequent public transport. And maybe look at things like, um, I don't know, it's a congestion, congestion tariffs or city access tariffs, uh, parking restrictions in the city so that people are less inclined to take their vehicles in and use the more frequent and free public transport that we could uh, implement. Uh, and that I think is the way to go. Um, David Smale, I have a, a question for you, and um, I, obviously off the back of um, your presentation, I was just wondering if you could just talk to us a little bit more about the collaborative efforts between TMR and AFPA. Um, I suppose, you know, how it actually came about and, and maybe to the impact that you're seeing. Thanks, Megan, yeah, uh, absolutely delighted to talk about that. Um, 
it was really a um, referring back to to David's presentations and Norell's an aha moment where uh, we were gathering as a board and and looking at how we could provide more impact for the community, um, working together as an association and alliance, if you like. And uh, it was TMR's um, suggestion, I must admit, that uh, that it was more through collaboration that we could could uh, provide that impact. Um, fortunately, we found ourselves very quickly aligned um, on what we both wanted to achieve, as in the government and the industry. And, and then we set about actually structuring our departments as well um, to be able to deliver on, on that implementation. So changing from, I guess, um, technically um, biased uh, consultative approach to um, aligning uh, on strategic imperatives and collaborating strongly, um, having joint committees working together um, with with members from both government, um, from from TMR, and uh, and from our technical committees and and our industry, uh, all working together on the same committees. Um, people in charge of those committees that were were um, can make a significant impact. So, um, yeah, thank you for the question. It's a great question, and and uh, I hope I've answered it well. You have. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, Narelle, I'll pull you into the conversation. Um, James Turner from New South Wales had a question around, well, how to determine when existing infrastructure should be replaced or upgraded rather than maintained the original design line? Okay, that's a great question. And as I mentioned in um, my presentation, the asset management strategy is a critical strategy in considering the whole of life carbon cost as well. So in TMR, we have an approach of um, run, maintain and build. So we need to run a system where the infrastructure will provide and provide and operate services to ensure the appropriate level of service that's required by the state. We need to maintain the system so that um, there's an appropriate focus on repair and rehabilitation as we're able to do that. Um, particularly, as I talked about the bitumen seals, where this reduces the overall cost um, and the carbon cost of the transport infrastructure. But sometimes we do need to build and expand. And I know there is a lot of thought being given to this now um, in the you know, what David Hood just said about the decision to build roads often attracts the vehicles. Um, well, ultimately, when we have low emission vehicles, that will be less of an issue, but it's this tipping point issue that we're facing at the moment. Um, so we, we do have obligations to um, deliver infrastructure for what's required for safety and for the economy. Um, and so that those decisions relate to that. And through all of that, it's very important that it be data driven, that we understand what our maintenance strategies will deliver for us, um, because we're allocating funds in a forward way. You know, we have to program out those bitumen seals and recognize when a pavement may have been, um, or a structure may have been damaged by unexpected climate events. And we need to be able to quickly assess that and introduce that into the forward programming as well. So there's a lot of um, decisions to make there. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the as I said, in, in summary, and for those in the audience who are asset managers, that in time, lowest overall whole of life cost approach to managing an asset, what we understand to date is that that also aligns with the lowest carbon cost as well. When you do that checking in of preventing ultimate final failure and the need to rebuild, those just in time and appropriate interventions deliver the lowest carbon cost as well. Yeah, I think uh, if I can just jump in there and, and uh, add some weight to what Narelle is saying, she just finished by saying just in time interventions. 
and it's it's well documented. Um, every maintenance engineer, it's for them. It's one hundred and one. Um, intervene, you know, before before it's too late. Intervene just in time, ahead of time. Uh, monitor your your, your assets uh, because if you don't. Um, it's like painting a ha your house. The longer you leave it to put on that um, next coat of paint, um, the more pre preparatory work you're going to have to do to get a good finish. So get in there and uh, maintain those assets on time and save yourself some money and extend the life of your, of your pavement. Thanks, David. Um, David Hood, uh, a question's come in from Dennis Graff and the question is sustainability is the idea that what is consumed can be replenished over the same or less time frame. What are the current objective measures used when defining anything as sustainable? Okay, thanks, Megan. Um, I guess there are two ways of looking at this. There's first of all, the sustainability of the infrastructure project itself. What materials are you using? What greenhouse gas emissions are related to the project, its delivery and its operation? And how do you make it nature positive? Also to look at the whole of life costs of the project, look at uh, how it's reducing, uh, for instance, the costs over time in energy consumption or whatever. Secondly, I think you should look at the project and how it delivers sustainability outcomes for society. And I'm, I'm thinking there of behavioral change. You know, if you, for instance, provide good active transport stuff, as I mentioned earlier, People will get out of their cars, you change the behaviour because they can use bicycles to get to work quicker or they can use free and more frequent public transport to get to work. So the infrastructure has that, first of all, what can you do to make uh, the delivery itself less impactful on nature and the environment? And secondly, how does it change uh, society's use of the infrastructure for a better outcome for society? Thank you. Um, we've had a, a couple of live questions come through, so a big thank you to the audience. Um, this question is for, um, well, I'll throw it to the panel. Um, with the EVs increasing the wear in roads over ICE equivalents, has this been factored into the new pavement designs? I can probably talk to that, Megan. Um, NACO is currently reviewing our um, possible scenarios for EV introduction and overlaying that onto our maintenance schedules with um, potential mass increases. And pavements are quite complex in that there's um, the, the analysis of how you actually do the design varies with the different material type. So we really need to understand what sort of networks will be opened up, um, what sort of vehicles we can anticipate, and that's far from certain at this point, and um, what sort of pavements uh, impacts there will be for the respective route, the respective pavement, and the respective vehicle. So you can probably appreciate there's a lot of modelling and a lot of uh, speculative um, you know, uncertainty in terms of the, I mean, it's we're like it's like we're back at the beginning with Model T Fords, who knows what the next 20 years will bring. Um, so, and some low emission vehicles have got different mass uh, spectrums than others. And, you know, it's not something we can absolutely uh, determine at this point, but it is certainly something that we have got our eye on. And, you know, we have consulted with industry to try to understand this better and we are certainly setting up the models in the NACO project to review that. Excellent, great answer, Narelle. And I should have said that that question came through from Andrew Nunn. So apologies, Andrew, I, I didn't uh, reference you when I asked that one. Um, we did have another question come through from Lucas um, Skipper, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, and he has directed it to, to you, David Hood, um, and the question is, what are your views on building infrastructure being able to go off grid in the new future? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Who, who was it? Uh, that was Lucas. Lucas, thanks, Lucas, for that. Um, well, first of all, you can use the tools, the Green Building Council's tools for buildings, particularly the Green Star, 
and for infrastructure, use the uh, Infrastructure Sustainability Rating Scheme, the IS scheme. It, it goes through all the criteria that you can look at. I guess for the buildings, where most of my career uh, before infrastructure was in green buildings environment, where we looked at, first of all, energy efficiency. We are not yet implementing sufficient uh, in energy efficiency in our built environment to reduce uh, energy consumption and therefore greenhouse gases. We need passive design. We look more about solar orientation. We need insulation. It amazes me when I came up to Queensland where I went into a, a home on sale and I asked the real estate agent, is this house insulated? And he said, no, this is Queensland. You don't need insulation in Queensland. And he sort of thought you only need insulation in cold climates where you have to keep the heat in. Well, insulation also keeps the heat out, which is strange that they don't understand that. Um, and also, uh, nature positive design we should be looking at how we can design a building to reintroduce nature into the building i mean why don't we put a whole lot of things into our building designs that bring uh, wildlife back into the building environment you know green roofs for instance on the top of the building get a whole lot of insects back in to pollinate uh, everything that's going on around you put birds nests in the side of a building what's wrong with that you bring birds back into the environment there are a whole lot of things that you can do in terms of nature positive thinking and there's a lot of work going on in the biomimicry area where we can look at, at, at how nature solves these problems and introduce those into our built environment. There's a lot of work going on in the biomimicry area and in the development of, of nature positive buildings. I think oh, if, if I can much. help with that too, if I can jump in there, Megan, and help, help uh, Lucas with a little more mm -hmm. context. Now, I think what David's saying is exactly right, and the reduction in energy uh, of our buildings is important. But if we if we take our roads as our buildings, then the very things that we've been talking about is finding ways to reduce the energy that's that's needed to create the materials that we build our roads with. Uh, and and refer back to our presentation and our last presentation from myself and talking about re reducing the production temperature of mixes from 175 to 155 degrees in step one, in just stage one, uh, and, and um, adding recycled materials in and being able to have an immediate impact on the, the carbon footprint of our asphalt plant by 10%. So, yeah, what David's saying is exactly right. We need to reduce that energy that's required to do the build. Um, and we're, we're really moving the needle on that. But again, if I stress, Lucas, that it's, uh, it's on the back of some very strong collaboration between government and, in, and industry. Thanks, Megan. If I can come in as well, I mean, just using timber, for instance, as a construction material, there are now very, very high rise buildings, wholly timber with new laminated technologies, which is amazing. Um, and, and of course that locks carbon up in the timber. So you actually uh, saving greenhouse gases from concrete construction and concrete manufacture and so on in, in the built environment. Well, can I pose a question then? And, and this is one which came through from Vincent Tang. He, he asked, well, what is the best way to make design sustainable in your opinion? I guess uh, from my perspective, first of all, look at the embodied energies in the materials you're using in the, in the and we uh, both Narelle and David have been talking about the embodied energy, particularly in road building. Well, concrete in, in, in the built environment, the high rise buildings is enormous and the steel, the embedded energy in steel and concrete is very significant. So look at reducing that uh, through the use of different materials and different design techniques uh, in terms of uh, that printed bridge that I showed you, you can actually print the structures that just need the material where the strength is required and not waste material. So there's those sorts of things. Um, there's a lot of other things that if you go through the criteria in both the Green Star rating tool and the IS rating tool, look at all the things that you can do there in the very early planning of your project and then the measuring of, uh, of the impact of what you're doing in terms of your design. I think you need to look at those tools. Yeah, I if think, I can I just add to that. Um, there no, you ahead, go, David. Narelle. I think. Oh. <laughs> All right. Narelle, I'll, you I'll, go, I'll, 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 and then we'll, we'll end with David. So, Narelle, you go. Okay. All right. Good Thanks, job. Megan. It's obviously a topic we all want to talk to. Um, <laughs> I really like um, 
some of the uh, paradigms that I've learned since coming across into this space. One of the ones that really speaks to me is that refuse, reduce, reuse and recycle. You know, we really need to think about our embodied built world as precious. Um, it's, it's an asset and like any other asset, we try to preserve it and look after it um, to adjust it, you know, like your own home, you might add a room rather than paying the capital gains tax or whatever to buy a whole new house. Like there's just so many ways that instead of bulldoze and rebuild, that we can look at this. And a lot of that advantage, as David Hood said, happens in that early planning phase. And what I'm seeing in this space is that um, in the similar way to, you know, engineers would be familiar with um, your cost savings for your project happen in that really careful planning, estimating. You can control it up there and then it starts to get out of control in the bottom end. Um, and we really need to be putting a lot of care into that and trying to really think through how we can use those principles. Now, it's not always easy to refuse to build infrastructure. Um, you know, we are a growing population. Um, infrastructure does come to its end of use um, and it does need to be replaced, but we really need to give a lot of thought to this. Um, and I think our training really does equip us um, to just start to think beyond perhaps the normal paradigms that we've always thought in. And definitely that materials research um, and, and new materials. But, you know, having said that, we need to be really sure that we get the performance that we need from those new materials, our infrastructures, you know, our bridges are 100 years. We don't want to put something in there that's going to last 10 years because it's a rebuild then and that is just not a solution. Um, so we need careful careful research and the collaboration um, with industry is absolutely critical to that. There's there's room for, you know, sort of quick, quick ideas, but a lot of this stuff is huge bulk materials and incremental change. And, you know, we've been so fortunate in Queensland government and TMR to have had the support of the industry that we've had to date with pushing forward with this. Um, this, this is, you know, as David Hood says, this is for the kids and the grandkids. It's not just our company policies. And um, you know, it's just really terrific that we can work together on this and, and really put our minds to these problems. Can I leap in and thank you, Narelle, for mentioning the early planning stages. I worked on a project uh, some 20 years ago now where we wanted to introduce sustainability principles in the design phase, a very early briefing stage, actually. And we wanted to get the client to spell out what they wanted in terms of energy efficiency, uh, green star ratings and so on. And I got the response from the CEO of the, the organisation who said, no, we want a commercial proposition first. Let's see if it works commercially. Then we'll add sustainability if it's cost effective. Well, of course, the design went ahead and they looked at how can you now implement sustainability after the design was finished and it costs far, far too much. So the building is, is now finished with no sustainability initiatives in it whatsoever because that was just too costly to add them afterwards. Very important. Set the sustainability principles of your project right at the very beginning. David, did you want to, David Smell, did you want to jump in? Yeah, look, just, just quickly, you both, Narelle and David, you've, 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 you've said it so very well, but when people ask about sustainable and we think about the word, um, what does it mean? And you know, to me, sustainable means that it's going to last longer. Uh, and if we think about a road that needs to last longer, then it needs to have a longer life. Uh, and then if we think about things in perpetuity, um, and we think about a perpetual road pavement where we can build a pavement so that uh, we are, we don't have to ever replace it, but just maintain it. Uh, and if we're at, at a 13, 14, 15, 17 year interval, you know, um, milling off the top of that road to re re recover our surface evenness and the integrity of the road. And, and then what we mill off, we're, we're, we're using it to put back down again. And, and what a wonderful place that would be for us all. Thank you. I like to think of um, telling uh, designers in the briefing stage, think of your project in terms of sustainability outcomes that it will deliver, not so much a sustainable project. As David said, sustainable sometimes means it will last forever. 
And I've heard, often heard people saying, well, we're going to sustain something, which means we're just going to keep it going as it is now. I think you've got to shift that paradigm and thinking to what are the outcomes, the sustainability outcomes that your project will deliver for society and nature. Well, David Hood, um, a, a question came through from Angus Curry from the ACT, and his question was, from an engineering ethics standpoint, how responsible do you think the consulting engineer is for convincing their client to pursue a reduced carbon footprint in their project? Look, I think this is critically important. Um, in terms of being a consultant, you, you need to do the calculations on behalf of the client and show the client the future impacts of what the design might deliver and show them how using a whole of life uh, analysis and costing how implementing sustainability right at the beginning can save over the whole of life of the project document your recommendation make sure you get them on paper somewhere so there's a record of what you put to the client um, and i like to think of um some time ago i was doing some work with arab and they had a, uh, a sustainability policy which they required their clients to sign on to. And if the clients didn't sign on to that sustainability policy of Arabs, they wouldn't contract with them. So there's a very strong sort of um, influence there to get sustainability embedded in the client's thinking right at the beginning. And picture when your pro where your project sits on that chart that I showed you with the green bubbles on it. Where does the project sit along that horizontal axis in terms of is it degenerating nature and so on or is it starting to regenerate nature is it becoming part of nature that's a very good way of thinking of your project in delivering sustainability excellent thank you david smile I'll, I'll bring the conversation back to you um so just i suppose it is in your opinion what would help us to move the needle quickly on reducing the carbon footprint of an asphalt plant yeah, good. Yeah, that that is a good mm -hmm. question. I think uh, I really tried to cover that off in my presentation. That the changes that we're making with the Queensland government at the moment, it, it they're just incremental. Uh, the point that I was trying to make with that waterfall chart on the second or third last slide was that uh, you know together together uh, little things make a difference. Uh, certainly lowering the energy that's required to to dry the moisture from materials and then heat the materials is the most significant part of the energy that's required in an asphalt plant so if we can reduce that energy that will be where our biggest impact comes from uh, and when we talk about reducing it with warm mix then you know warm mix operating temperatures at 135 to 140 degrees are indeed very achievable it's uh, from memory, I think Japan has a, has a target temperature for production of, of mix at 120. So 140 is, is indeed you know, very achievable for all mix. And at the moment, we're, we're only looking at, it at 155. So that plus mm. recycled materials, you heard Narelle talk about glass and some of the projects that we're putting in there, certainly recycled asphalt, crumb rubber, um, the, or all things that will move the needle very quickly, um, Megan. Excellent, thank you. Um, Narelle, I've got a question which came through from Avril Thompson and, and Avril's um, based in WA. And her question is, how do you share the risk of innovation? So by nature, we're trying something new and asking an agency to carry the future risk. So probably maybe some words of advice around that um, sharing of risk. Yeah, well, risk, risk sharing is definitely um, an issue in accepting innovation. And, you know, engineers would know that it's proportional to um, the impact or the safety risk um, and the sort of uh, life and, and the cost. So, you know, if you're, if you're innovating for a new material that goes underneath you, uh, at the back of your kitchen bench, it's going to be a very different risk profile to innovating a material that needs to go onto a pavement surfacing or a bridge. Um, and so the way that we would approach it would be commensurate with that risk. How we would share would be, um, you know, possibly within the um, maintenance and um, contract schedules, 
what is the defect liability period, what is the warranty period. Currently in Queensland, we have um, relatively short defect liability periods uh, for our works and that relates to you know, the confidence that we have in our procurement systems. Typically our pavements would only have a um, three month defect period. So to move beyond that to something that is new um, requires quite a bit of thought as to the confidence also that we have in the sort of requirements that we're asking to be innovated to. So we are moving more towards performance-based requirements and certainly industry has been asking for that um, as we try and um, develop new materials to address the carbon implications. And there's national projects with Austroads to uh, be exploring options for performance requirement performance specifications for asphalt and um, I understand also where we, we're doing some research for performance requirements for concrete mixes so it, yeah it's very much about um, knowing your risk profile knowing what your warranty and um, and uh, accountabilities are during the contract period um, having options that you can benchmark to with performance requirements. And even then, you know, you heard the story there of how we introduced EME asphalt into Australia. Um, there, there was an extensive program of laboratory testing, field trials, benchtop um, literature reviews, and across multiple, um, multiple experts, industry, multiple states, you know, these things take a long time because they are high risk, high cost bulk materials. So, um, and universities definitely have a role to play with some of the early work um, to, you know, give some indication for new ideas. So it's, it's, it, it needs to be collaborative. Um, it needs to really speak to the use that it's going to be applied to and also the commercial aspects of warranties and so forth. And there's not really one answer, it's more um, a set of criteria that um, we would be assessing that against. Don't know if you've got anything to add there, David. Smale, mm. from your experience? No, I think you've said it all, Narelle, and I think the, um, I guess the, the collaboration between the department and industry is is instrumental, but uh, I think covered it very well. Excellent. Well, for for well, Queensland, then. yeah, for Queensland um, TMR, the collaboration with industry has been at the heart of um, the innovations that we've been able to introduce. So we're, um, you know, we we just hope that we can continue to power on with that with our strategic alliance and our other consultations with um, our other peak bodies. Good job. Excellent. That's, I think, a, a fabulous place uh, to end today's discussion, unless anyone would like to put forward any final comments um, to our audience. No, no? I'm, I'm fine. Thanks, Megan. And uh, yeah, <laughs> great to be part of it and really delighted. Great. Well oh, done, I'm Megan. So oh, look, thank you all so much um, for your time today and your your presentations and your inputs. Um, it's been a, a wonderful session. So to our audience, um, if you could just join me in thanking Professor D David Hood, Narelle Dobson and David Smale for their time and input in our Thought Leader Series webinar today. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, the Department of Transport and Main Roads for their support. I'm also, I should say, I think I've said also too many times, but very excited to announce Engineers Australia's 2024 Climate Smart Engineering Conference um, is happening here in Brisbane on the 22nd of August and our early bird registrations have just been launched. So please follow the QR code on the screen for more information. And if I could also please ask everyone, 
to help us to improve and plan um, future sessions like today, if you could complete the short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. And finally, thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders event. Good afternoon.